and hopefully we'll get to know you better and find out just how awesome you really are. All right. So uh, a little girl is sitting on her grandfather's lap, just kind of looking up at him, and she touches his face and, and then touches her own face and kind of looks up and says, Grandpa, did God make you? Why, yes, he did. He made me a long time ago. She kind of reaches up and touches his face and touches her. Grandpa, did, did God make me? Yes, he made you just a little while ago. She kind of touches his face and touches her own and says, God's getting better at this, isn't he? <laughs> just a little. <laughs> yeah, I'm not quite a grandfather yet. Um, But I'm assuming I've had lots of practice. My kids love to make fun of me being older. But I'm in complete denial, and uh, I'm not going down without a fight. Anyways. Anyways, I don't usually like to preach the holidays. It's just kind of not my thing. I usually don't do that. Uh, but this year I did feel on, on Mother's Day to just encourage the ladies, and this morning I did want to actually encourage the men here this morning. And, uh, you know, if you just want to turn to the beginning of your Bible, you're familiar with this verse. In Genesis chapter 1, right back in the beginning. Verse 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him. And, uh, you know, it's becoming, the obvious is becoming more clear to those who have eyes to see, and that is that we need men to be men and women to be women. Okay? And uh, even, even in a lot of the secular studies, they're, they're discovering what should be obvious, and that is, uh, generally speaking, children will do better if they have a dad and a mom. We need the influence of men, and we need the influence of women in our lives. Um, and the impact of fatherhood really, really is tremendous. Uh, we're seeing that, and that's not to imply in any way that those who have not had a father um, if you're a single mom and you know dad's not around, that's not to imply in any way that your that your child is handicapped in life. That's not what I mean. Okay, that's not what I mean at all. Um, I just mean that there's great value in men being men and women being women, and we need the impact of both. And, uh, and there's a lot of confusion today. And one of the things that really uh, grieves me, that really grieves me, is to see the way that men get portrayed in the media. I don't know if you've noticed. Uh, generally speaking, especially if you watch like TV shows and movies and stuff, you, I mean, there's like there's like two stereotypes. Either men are portrayed as buffoons and idiots, kind of incompetent boobs. Is this not sitting very well? Why don't you just stand here and hold it for me, sweetie? Uh, you need women too, right? <laughs> <laughs> After two years, I would learn how to use this thing. Maybe I should just use the handheld. You know, it's like this every morning as I get dressed. This is <laughs> okay, maybe the portrayals are accurate. <laughs> I 
That's just too funny. You have a funny sense of humor look. All right, so if I can get back on track here. It really does grieve me to see some of the stereotypes, and oftentimes men are portrayed either as buffoons and idiots, don't know what they're doing, or they're portrayed in this kind of hyper, super manly type thing where they're strong and, they're, and they can fight and things like that, but they're completely dysfunctional in every other area of life. Have you ever noticed how Mother's Day cards portray moms as heroes and Father's Day cards portray men as incompetent? Yes. Uh huh. The top selling Father's Day cards this year made fun of dad for beer drinking, golf, farting, being a caveman, and sitting in front of the TV. <laughs> okay, now listen. I'm like all for making fun of ourselves. Okay, and listen, in, in, in our family, you won't survive a day if you can't laugh at yourself. And being the head of the house, I get to laugh at myself the most. And, uh, and we love to make fun of the things that dad does. And I have a wonderful history of, you know, one of the favorite sayings that kids like to make fun of me for is, it looked much better in my head. Because I, I have a long record of having brilliant, ingenious ideas that just aren't executed very well <laughs> and don't go so well. So there's nothing wrong with making fun of ourselves and taking light and, and things like that. Um, but I do think it, it really just, just grieves me that that becomes the portrayal of what men are like. And it's not true. It also grieves me when men only see their value in their work, in, their, uh, in, in the way in which they provide financially for their families, or if they only see their value in their physical prowess. And none of those things are wrong, but there's so much more. And I think the ultimate value of manhood, if you will, the ultimate value of manhood is that it's an expression of God's image and likeness. Male and female, he created them. Now, it's interesting, um, and a lot of biblical scholars are kind of coming to this. They're, they're beginning to uh, understand uh, Genesis that I just read, uh, the beginning of Genesis, really in its temple imagery. And what I mean by that is, if, if you're familiar with the, a lot of the Old Testament, uh, there's a real strong temple imagery in the Old Testament. And Moses, of course, is the one who is generally considered to have written the first five books of the Bible. And, of course, with Moses, one of the most prominent themes in, in Moses' life and in his ministry, if you will, and in his writing, is the central place of the temple in the life of Israel. As a matter of fact, we're told that Moses spent time on the mountain in the glory of the Lord where the point where he didn't even have to take sustenance. This is a supernatural, I mean seriously supernatural encounter he's having with God. And some feel he actually had several of them on the mountain like this. And we're told that one of the things he saw, one of the things, the, re the revelation he was given was he was shown that the, the, the pattern of the temple in heaven, if you will, and that, and that sort of um, uh, created uh, the way he understood how God was working on the earth. Okay? And what I mean by that is creation is a, is a picture, if you will, of a temple, a temple for the very presence of God. Okay? And even in Genesis... In the beginning chapter, there's, there's a temple imagery there. Um, it's, it's, it's describing the way in which God prepared creation as a temple for his presence. And when you look at uh, a lot of pagan practices, when they built their temple, what was the very last thing they put in the temple? An image of their God. And that's the exact same thing we said. I'm not trying to say. I'm not trying to use pagan imagery. I'm, I'm talking about redeemed imagery and redeemed humanity. But we see that same thing. God creates creation, if you will, as a temple, as a place for His presence. And the last thing He puts is what? His image in the temple. And. Um, 
you know, the the purpose, if you will, of that um, was to be like a mirror. I mean, think about an image. Think of like a mirror, except don't think of a flat mirror against a wall. In other words, God is, didn't just put man as his image so that he could look at himself and see what he looks like. A flat mirror like, I'm going to look, what do, well, oh, let me look at, that's what I look like. No, think of an angled mirror. When you have an angled mirror, what does an angled mirror do? Yeah, in other words, instead of just looking straight and straight back, an angled mirror allows you to look at something. And the idea of this angled mirror, this idea that we have the that we are made in the image of God, is a reflection both from God to mankind as well as from mankind to God. That all of the praises of creation would be summed up in the worship of humanity towards God, and that God's goodness and who he is would be reflected back. Okay, And so when we think about being made in the image and the likeness of God, it's, it's uh, more than just something beautiful. It's actually, it's, as, a, as someone once described it, it's actually a vocation. It's a vocation. Let me use an analogy. If you've ever seen a, a, a beautiful violin... There's an abs they're absolutely beautiful. And when you see a violin that's been made, it is beautiful to look at. It is a stunning piece of creation. But it was meant for what? To be played. It was meant to create music. And so you and I, in a sense, were made to play music. We were meant to reflect God to the world and to reflect the world back to God. It's a vocation. It's a being, if you will. And so when in Genesis it says that God was finished after creation, it doesn't mean that he was done with his plan. He was just done with the building project. So if you think about it, if you're building a house, when you build a house, when the house is done, you're not done. You're only done building the house, but being done building with the house means you're going to begin living. So Genesis is not the completion, it's the beginning. It's the beginning. But we know, of course, that the plan got subverted. And thank goodness with Jesus, the plan is back in action. And it's back on track. And so real manhood has got to be connected, if you will, defined in terms of the image and the likeness of God. Same with femaleness, of course, but we're talking about men today. And there's so much confusion today. I mean, picture for a moment who you would consider to be a manly man, a man's man. Like your ideal of like what it means to be a man, a real man's man. Just take a moment. Who would that be? Okay. How many of you picture Jesus? <laughs> I'm thinking he's the manliest man there is. A real man's man. You know, and so often, I mean, you know, we just picture him as see him on Sunday school walls and in a in a, little, in a in a field, and he's got sheep and little children and a rainbow behind him. And I think it was John Eldridge who just said, you know, sometimes we just picture Jesus like Mister Rogers in a beard. <laughs> And of course he's he's gentle and I, and I you know but 
But he's a, he is the manliest man there is. Come on. He is what defines what real men look like. And there's so much confusion. I mean, you know, we think about men. We think they're st strong and courageous. A man provides for his family. A man protects his family. A man is the spiritual leader of his home. Men like to build. They like to conquer. They like to accomplish. They like a cause to fight for. Oftentimes, men are usually associated with liking sports, being active, being rough and tumble. You know, the running joke among guys, we, you know, we oftentimes laugh at, at ladies and sometimes the drama and stuff like that. It's like, here's how guys deal with drama and disagreement. With the, they just go out back, beat the heck out of each other, and the next day we're good. That's kind of the running joke among guys. <laughs> True story, it's a little embarrassing. My kids, I won't name names, but I've got two boys, and I won't say which is which was in which category, <laughs> you know. But they have a tendency, and they had a tendency when they were young to get, you know, very rough with each other. And and one in there was one stage where one was more aggressive than the other, and took it out on his brother a lot. And so I was trying to figure out how to deal with this. And so my great fatherly wisdom to my other son, who was who was the subject of this aggression was go to the gym, take boxing lessons, and the next time your brother gets aggressive with you, flatten him and you'll, you'll end the problem. <laughs> that <sighs> so my wife is like, that's the best you could come up with. The spiritual leader and head of our home and that's what you want me to follow. <laughs> Sorry, honey. It's all I can think of. And so we think of, oftentimes, we think of these things as what defines a man. And um, it's just unhealthy. Okay? I think it would be a whole lot better to really define it in terms of the image of God and the likeness of God. Let's look to Jesus as the real definition of what manhood looks like. You know, one of the things we have, I think we have to be careful of when we're defining manhood and looking at what it means, oftentimes I see it's like, okay, what's the opposite of being a male? That's what we think of, right? The opposite of masculine is feminine. And uh, here's the challenge in that. We oftentimes begin to define manhood by distancing it from the female. Even in the term opposite sex, I don't actually like that term because it actually sets up an opposition between the sexes. And we actually begin to fall into this thing where it's like, you know, we've been taught that the differences between men and, and women divide us. Men can't understand women and women can't understand men. Well, who told us that? Hello? What are you talking about? That is absolutely so not true. And yes, we absolutely, you know, there's there's a there's a there's an effort to try to eliminate the difference between men and women in our in our right attempt to understand that men and women are created equal. We've had to we've wanted to say, okay, therefore they must be the same and interchangeable. And of course that's not the case. God created in us in his image male and female. God's the one who made the distinction that's good. But I don't think we want to begin to think about maleness and femaleness as somehow opposites and antagonistic to each other. And you know, when you start to define masculinity as as distancing itself in opposite of femininity, what happens when when young men, boys, have certain things that we don't normally associate with masculinity? We begin to think, oh that must be feminine then. Come on. There was a day when things like the arts or music or dancing were considered not manly. So men who had interest in those things all of a sudden are portrayed as feminine. And that's not how, how we want to do it. Listen, I think here's, you know, I've thought about this issue a lot. I've struggled with, like, how do you really define manhood and femalehood? And I'm just, I'm honestly coming to the conclusion that if we will just embrace our identity in Christ 
and let him be formed in us. If you're a man, your manhood will get expressed. And if you're a woman, your femalehood will get expressed. And instead of trying to create certain stereotypes and images, if we would just focus on, on the image of Christ in us, and I'm telling you, men, you're, you're, you're men. Follow Jesus and your manhood will just come on out. You know what the biblical definition of manhood is? might be a little different than you think. The biblical definition, I believe, of manhood is this. Growing up. See, the opposite of man is child. There's a great scripture in, uh, in 1 Kings. David's on his deathbed, and he's getting ready to pass things on to his son Solomon. And he says, be strong and become a man. And his point was, it's time to grow up. And he goes on and he says, now keep the charge of the Lord... Walk in his ways so that the Lord may carry out his promise. And so as David is, is, is dying and passing on to his son, he says, Solomon, it's now time to become a man. <clears throat> and when he tells his son to become a man, what is the thing he encourages him? He encourages him to keep the charge of the Lord. He encourages him to walk in the ways of the Lord. He encourages him to say, listen, God has got a promise. Walk in such a way that God may carry out his promise through you. He was telling him it was time to grow up. Grow up into the image and to the likeness of God. Now, King Solomon is not the best example for us in Scripture. I mean, you know that King Solomon started strong but ended really poorly. And they know why he started off so strong, but he ended so poorly? Well, I think it was this. Instead of making it about the Lord and becoming like, becoming like the Lord and the character of the Lord, he made it about himself. It's interesting. If you do a, do a, um, a contrast between the book of Proverbs and the book of Ecclesiastes, it's a fascinating thing. And um, listen, the book of Proverbs was written early in Solomon's life. The book of Ecclesiastes was written later in Solomon's life. The book of Ecclesiastes, to me sometimes, is like the book of Eeyore. <laughs> right? All is meaningless. All is vain. And um, honestly, <laughs> and this may... <laughs> This, this, I don't know, some of you might not like what I'm about to say, but you know, part of what the book of Ecclesiastes is there to show, it's there to show the wisdom without, without the Spirit of God. Sometimes we exalt the book, and listen, the, the book of Ecclesiastes, of, of Ecclesiastes is Scripture, okay? But it's, it's meant really to be a contrast. The, the, the whole summation in the book of Ecclesiastes, when all is said and done, the best that Solomon can say is, make it about God. Now, that's a really good conclusion. But most of it is about his folly in making life about himself. The wisdom that God had given him, he said, now, I'm, I, if you read it, it becomes about me. I decided to seek after pleasure. I decided to, to do this. I decided to, to explore and discover this. And all he did in all of his discovery and everything that he wanted to accomplish, everything, because he, he was a man... I mean, he was a man's man. He was a man who built things, who was who accomplished things. He he built a man. I mean, it was the it was considered the most glorious time for the nation of Israel. Its wealth and its strength and its military might was at its absolute peak. He lived every man's dream, unsanctified, unredeemed man's dream. He built things. He had women. He was a ladies' man. But he didn't become a man. And he made his life about himself. And at the end, all he could say was, that was vanity, and that was pointless, and it didn't amount to anything. 
all that really matters is the fear of God. He, all he did was get back to the beginning. At the end of his life, he just realized what he already knew was the beginning. Because in the book of Proverbs, if you read, it's all about receiving the instruction of the Lord. It's all about the wisdom of God. And in the beginning of the book of Proverbs, he says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And in Ecclesiastes, after his entire life of running in his own strength and in his own desires and his own dreams, all he ended up was discovering what he already knew at the very beginning of his life. Paul writes to the Corinthians. This is a, a, a verse that, that a lot of men's ministries like for good reason. It's a great verse. And Paul writes to the Corinthians at the very end in chapter 16. He says, now act like men. Act like men. <clears throat> but if you look at the context of the whole entire letter, he's writing as a father to a church and basically saying, listen, it's time to grow up. I understand. Listen, you got all this passion and zeal. It's wonderful. Good. Go for it. But in your passion and your zeal, you really have to get what's most important. What's the most important thing? To grow up into Christ and to love. Yeah, it's good that you've got all these wonderful gifts and you've got all this and that going and, and you're, you, know, you love wisdom and you love this, but, but grow up into what really matters, what it really means. Act like men. Grow up into Christ. And he says, be on the alert. Stand firm in the faith. Be strong and let all that you do be done in love. That's the last thing he says as he sums up his letter to the Corinthians. Yeah. In, in, uh, in his famous chapter on love, Paul even makes a statement, when I was a child, I thought like a child, but when I became a man, and that was the chapter on love. He became a man as he grew up into Christ. To be a man, I think, means to grow up into the very likeness of Jesus. So how about things like the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are manly qualities. So yes, it's good to provide for your family, but let's provide love and peace, and joy. It's good to protect your family, but let's protect them from the schemes of the enemy, the things that would come in to rob of these qualities. And so I want to encourage the men, you do not need to let the false caricatures of the world, and sometimes, and sometimes even in the church we embrace these things, really define who you are. Let Christ define who you are. You have an amazing life to live. The impact that you can have as men is truly astounding. I just want to close with this uh, scripture from Paul, and it's uh, again from Corinthians to chapter 15. the very last verse in chapter 15. In chapter 15, Paul is talking about the resurrection of Christ. And he, and he goes on. It's, just a, it's a wonderful chapter on the resurrection of, of Christ. This is the chapter where Paul says, listen, if Christ did not rise from the dead, then we are running our race in vain. You're believing for no, for no particular uh, purpose. It's, a, it's, it's all foolishness. We're, the, we're the, of all men to be pitied if Christ did not rise from the dead. And so this whole chapter is on the resurrection. And he, as, he, as he gets ready to close this chapter, he says, the first man is from the earth, and the second man is from heaven, meaning Adam was earthly, 
Christ was from heaven. As is the earthly, so also are those who are on the earth. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. Just as we have borne the image of the earthly, we also now bear the image of the heavenly. Meaning, we had borne the image of Adam in his fallen nature. Now we bear the image of Christ in his fullness. But then he ends with this. He says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Now, I find that amazing statement. Paul's talking about the resurrection, and he does this wonderful teaching on it. And at the end of that, he says, Therefore, given that, know this, that your work today, now, is not in vain. And sometimes, you know, in Christianity, we have so focused on heaven as a place we go after we die that sometimes we wonder, what is the point of our life here? Someone once said, we have an embarrassing problem between our baptism and our funeral. What do we do? Because of Christianity's focus so much on praying the prayer to get to heaven and then going to heaven when you die, what do you do in between? What is the point? Especially if it's all going to get wrecked anyways. If God's got a wrecking ball that's going to wreck everything and it's all going to go up in a fiery explosion and you can do something new, what's the point of what we're doing now? And Paul's coming against that whole thing. He's saying actually because of the, re because of the resurrection, because Christ is alive, which means he's alive today, now, and working now, because of that, you can have confidence that what you do is not in vain. That somehow, whether it's big or small, whether you think it's significant or not, especially whether the world thinks it's significant or not, doesn't matter. What does matter is you can have confidence that what you're doing is playing a part in what God is bringing about to pass. And so, fathers, men in this room, you know, I just want to encourage you, the, the part you have to play, the role you have to play, as being a man, whether you're a husband, whether you're a uh, you know, father, uh, son, whether you're about to be, will be one day, everything that you do in the image of Christ, as you do the work of the Lord, as you let his image define who you are and live from that place, you can have complete confidence that your work is not in vain. That what you are doing whether anyone else recognizes it, whether the world considers it significant or not, whether you've got a statute to, mem to memorialize you or not, whether the world creates your legacy or notices it or not, doesn't matter. What you are doing, what you will do with your life is not in vain. It is absolutely part of what God is doing and what he is accomplishing. Amen. 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 All right. I'm done. <clears throat> Could we close in a, in, a, in, a, in a worship song? Can you guys come on up? Worship team, come on up. And As you guys get ready to just enjoy the rest of your Father's Day, call your dads. For those of you whose dads are still with us, Yeah, I'd encourage you to, if you've got spiritual fathers, just uh, give them a call or send them a text, send them a note, tell them how much you appreciate them, honor them. But as we get ready to do that, let's just uh, close out in a time of worship to our Heavenly Father. Because we have the best dad. So, Father, as we get ready just to uh, close our time out here today, um, I just ask that you would bless the men here today, the fathers who are here today, Lord, even those who could not make it, actually. I just pray a blessing over you in the name of Jesus. 
I just pray that his love would grow ever stronger in you. Father, that you would just remove false identities, false images of what it means to be a man. Thank you, Lord. Father, that you would strengthen each of us in our inner man by your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Forever, oh Lord, my God, 
I will give thanks to you, oh Lord, my God. I will give thanks to you forever, oh Lord, my God. I will give thanks to you. <laughs> You turn my board in. Turn my board into dancing. Put off my rags. Throw me the flags. And I will rise. And I will praise you. I'll sing. And I'll be silent. Yeah. Oh, my God. I will give thanks to you forever, oh Lord, my God. I will give thanks to you, oh Lord, my God. I will give thanks to you forever, oh Lord, my God. I will give thanks to you, your mercy. Your mercy will be remembered forever. 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 Your mercy will be. Remembered forever, your mercy will be remembered forever. Oh Lord, my God, oh Lord, my God. I will give thanks to you forever, O oh Lord, my God. I will give thanks to you, O oh Lord, my God. I will give thanks to you forever, O oh Lord, my God. I will give thanks to you. Oh Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Oh Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you. Happy Father's Day.